Good morning, Knicks Nation. Today is Tuesday. It is the 18th day of January 2022. I hope you had a good weekend. I hope you're healthy and COVID-free today. I hope that your family is also healthy and COVID-free and that the needs of you and your family in terms of food, shelter, clothing, and health are being met today. Blessings upon those that work in the healthcare field and those who are first responders who are every day trying to save human lives. Blessings also, special blessings on those peoples on the island of Tonga, where a massive volcano, undetected, blew up less than 48 hours ago and caused death and destruction on the island, as well as destruction on apparently five continents. Blessings upon all of those who are the survivors and on the souls of those who pass. Blessings also upon those that pick up garbage for us, keeps our streets and sidewalks clean, and those that do the menial task of making deliveries for our convenience. Double blessing on the men and women trying to save, deliver, and rescue boys and girls, children, teenagers, and adults from being victims of prostitution and child prostitution, victims of pornography, victims of child pornography, human trafficking, and sex slavery. Victims of child molestation and pedophilia. Blessings upon those trying to help as well as blessings upon those victims. And double curses on the profiteers and perverts. Training and traveling and trading in this misery. Finally, blessings upon the homeless. Nearly 600,000 men, women, and children in the United States right now on January 18th without a roof over their head. Or one step away from the street. Also, millions around the world in similar and worse conditions. Blessing upon them, for theirs is the kingdom and those trying to help. There was a basketball game yesterday afternoon at Madison Square Garden. At one o'clock matinee, our New York Knicks fell to the Charlotte Hornets, 97-87. A couple of things from the game. You know, um, generally speaking, there's sometimes, sometimes. Oh, let me tell you a story. I was watching, I was hearing about this kid back in the 70s. And he was putting up huge numbers on at a small college. Um, and it was Portland State. He had scored 88 points in one game. He couldn't make the pros, though. Or at least he came to the pros. He didn't make the pros, but he didn't play very long in the pros. His name was Freeman Williams. So then there was the other kid. I never saw this kid play, but I heard about him. He was scoring 40 points a game. I thought to myself, man, he's probably like Freeman Williams. Then and I saw a picture of him, this pale Caucasian boy. I said, this boy can't play no ball. Then I actually saw him play in college, and I thought to myself, mm, you know, he's a shooter. You know, he'll average 18 a game in the NBA as a shooter if he get his shot off. Too slow, white dude, can't play. That dude's name was Larry Bird. And not only was I wrong, <laughs> got to the point where when the Knicks played Boston and we were up one or two with anything over a second left, I was scared when Larry Bird was on the other side of the court. And so I say that to say, I'm willing to admit when I'm wrong about a player. And I've been wrong before about guys. That was probably the biggest one, Larry Bird, to be honest with you. But honestly, I've been right more than I've been wrong. And I learned from Larry Bird. That helped me. <laughs> I never judged a player the same way again after him. But I wanted the Knicks to choose Miles Turner in the draft. They got Kevin Knox. And to me, that was the second red flag that came up with David Fisdale. The first one was his opening day press conference when the Knicks had just traded for Emmanuel Moutier and they had drafted Frank Nilakina. And at the press conference, he didn't just talk about the entire team. He addressed Moutier saying, okay, we're going to get you right. And I was concerned about that. The second red flag came. <laughs> When I read reports about how excited Fisdale was after a workout with Kevin Knox and Miles Turner, I mean, uh, Miles Bridges, sorry, Miles Turner, I kept saying Miles Bridges, 
where he was all hyped about the workout and was going to make a decision to draft Kevin Knox based on that one workout. You see, I like I like to look at players and I try to look at it, like I said, I said before, on a macro level. I try to look at the overall game that could be developed from the player, um, the talents they bring to the table that make them NBA ready or NBA eligible. And so on and so forth. And so what I saw with Miles, there was obviously a, a, a um, he was he was a little husky at Michigan State, but I thought it was baby fat. Uh, he seemed to work really hard during the game on both ends of the floor. And then there was the the athleticism is what stood out obviously above everything else. He was going to be in the NBA just based on that. But I saw upside as far as being a two way overall player. I didn't know he was going to have a jump shot or anything, but. I felt like he could definitely play both forward spots, the three or the four. Um, and so I wanted the Knicks to draft him. I, I thought, you know, and then my second choice was McCall Bridges, who I didn't see has the, the upside of, of Miles, but the length, the defense, the program he came out at, at Villanova. And then that also helped me with, with, with Miles Bridges coming out of Tom Izzo's program. Tom Izzo is another guy that put a lot of guys in the NBA, just really good. Uh, farm system for the NBA at Michigan State when he was coaching. Well, the same with Villanova, obviously. So I wanted Miles, and then I wanted McCall, and I can't remember who I wanted after that because I felt like one of those two were going to be available at nine, and they were. And then Knicks picked, you know, Kevin Knox. Now I was all cheerleading for Kevin Knox because he's a Nick. I cheerlead for every Nick, regardless. Okay, if they're wearing the Nick uniform, I'm going to be on. I'm not going to be tripping like some of y'all crapping on him every chance I get. But then again, like I said, there's a small segment of Knicks Nation whose lives are so miserable, they're not happy unless they're crapping on somebody. I get that. But I was going to cheer for Kevin, root for Kevin, pull for Kevin for life now, as long as he's in the NBA, even in Atlanta, whatever team he ends up on, because he was a former Nick. But I really did want Miles Bridges. Well, I told y'all yesterday's video that I thought LaMelo Ball is going to go off because it's Madison Square Garden. He's box office type player. He's superstar in the making. But then I told you also that Miles Bridges was having an all-star season. Now you see why. Okay. What we saw yesterday wasn't some no-name player that comes to Madison Square Garden and has a career night to tell his grandkids about. No, no, no. Miles Bridges, <laughs> he's he's coming to be all-star. Matter of fact, um, I think he'll get picked for the team. He probably won't get voted in. I think the coaches will pick him like they did Julius Randle last year. Um, and he should. He's really that good, and he's going to get better. He turned down four years, sixty million from the Hornets before the season started. Turned it down, and that's when I knew he's unless he got hurt, he's going to have a monster year because, you know, you don't turn down that kind of money. Well, apparently he was right because <laughs> he is having a monster year. Okay, so he scores thirty eight against the Knicks, but what the thing is that really. You know, I wasn't surprised at the spins into the lane with either hand. I wasn't surprised at, of course, the finish at the rim. I was surprised at him hitting those three-point shots, though. I was I was very surprised to see him nailing that three. I shouldn't have been because he works. The kid, this guy works really hard on his game. That's one of the way, think, reasons I like. Like I said, when I first saw him at Michigan State, I could tell he was a hard worker. You could see he was working hard. He had a lot of baby fat on him. But I, I you know, I thought, okay, he could work, he's going to work that off. And he has. But five of nine from three, 14 of 20 from the field, 38 points plus 26. Yeah, it, 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 we didn't get beat by a scrub team. Okay, so I want y'all to understand something. I'm not going to blame any player. Some of y'all looking for blame, you know, on why the Knicks lost. Sometimes a team is just better than you on a given night. I'm not saying they're better than the Knicks in a seven-game series, but they're better than the Knicks on a given night. That just happens. This is the NBA, okay? And what had happened, if you remember, Friday, I told y'all, Charlotte lost to Orlando. <laughs> and I'm saying, Orlando, one of the low teams in the, in the league, and Charlotte was beating teams like Chicago. They were beating the Lakers. They were beating the Brooklyn. They were beating good teams, you know, during the course of the year. To lose to Orlando was a real downer. That was their last game. So they didn't play Saturday. They didn't play Sunday. And then they come in on the matinee Monday and they are hungry in Madison Square Garden to redeem themselves. Even when they announced that LaMelo Ball wasn't going to play, I was still concerned because of the rest of the team. Look, Scary Terry is a real deal. Miles Bridges is the real deal. That Martin kid, 
is a good, you know, rotational piece. And of course, there's Gordon Haywood, who's, you know, again, a night, a, one of the top third options, you know, I would say in the NBA. So you had that. And then they're well coached. JJ Barrera is a, a, a Borrego is a really good coach, defensive oriented coach. They, they, they are a high scoring team. Like, um, Charlotte, I think they average, if I'm not mistaken, they average like 115 points a game. Um, let me just see that. Yeah, they average almost 115 points a game. They give up on 15 a game. So yesterday they scored 97, which shows you the Knicks defense wasn't as good. And to me, it was a defensive problem mostly. Wasn't as good, but the Knicks offense was even worse, scoring only 87 points. Now, when you look at the game, when you look at the game, I saw my, my observation was the Knicks had low energy to begin the game, very low energy. That's not unusual for a matinee game. Okay. I'm not giving them any excuse, but it's not unusual for a matinee game for a team to come out with low energy, particularly if you look at what happened now. Charlotte played Friday. I'm not sure if it was at Orlando or if it was at Charlotte. It don't matter. They they were able to come to New York early, get acclimated, practice, and then have and then be in their raring to go because they want to redeem themselves from Friday night. The Knicks come off a win on Saturday night against Atlanta, fly back, get in Sunday, you know, probably early, three o'clock in the morning, whatever, and then they gotta get ready for a matinee game at the garden. So they're gonna be a little sluggish, right? And this was the wrong team at the wrong time to come out sluggish, right? So they came out uh like gangbusters trying to, you know, redeem themselves from the from the poor game they had. And first quarter, they outscored the Knicks 34-23, second quarter 28-21, and then the Knicks finally started to wake up in the second half. And it was too late, you know. They were Miles Bridges was was hitting every clutch shot they needed to hit. The, if I had a critique of the Knicks aside from the low energy yesterday, they were not getting out to the three point line. They were not getting out to the three point line. Charlotte shot 65%. Am I wrong about that? No, 36%. 36% from three yesterday. 14 of 39. But the big one was Miles Bridges, five of nine from three. Gordon Hayward, three of eight from three. Terry Rozier, four of 11 from three. Those are the big ones right there. And they, they were also daggers. The Knicks shot 35% from three, but mostly it was too late. You know, like I said, they came at the end, but really what told you they were low energy, foul shooting, right? So the Knicks, they were missing some, I mean, and these guys, you know, they don't, you know, you could tell low energy, 11 of 21 from the foul line. That's not lack of practice foul shooting. That's tired, sluggish. That's what that is. Tired, sluggish foul shooting. Okay. We see that, uh, when they lost uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I forgot who that was. A, de- a Boston. They lost to Boston. Same thing. Shooting 52% from the line. You're not going to beat anybody in the NBA. You're just not going to do it. Okay. So that was a major thing as well. It wasn't, and, and I can't, like, for example, most of the time, Julius Randle's, you know, the, the guy we beat up in these situations. I can't beat up Julius Randle. I mean, he was six for 16, three or seven, but the cat was hustling. He was, he was nine is 22. He scored 18, but he normally 10 boards. You know, he was hustling. He was hustling. He just didn't, you know, they, what, he's going to score 30 every night? No, he's not going to do that. We already know that that Julius Randle's not a guy that's going to carry your team. And this is an example of a game like that. So, say, for example, and let's say Julius Randle was Kevin Durant. Okay, let's say he was a 28, because Julius is 28 now. Let's say he was a 28-year-old Kevin Durant. On a game that we're low energy, that's a superstar will carry you to a win. Right. A superstar would do that. But that's why they're superstars. Right. So a guy like a Kevin Durant or if you're low energy and you got a Stephon Curry, he might get 55, you know, and you win the game anyway that you should have lost. Right. We don't have that guy yet. OK. And some of y'all, like when I talked about Jalen Brunson, number one, I don't want Jalen Brunson. It's not me that's saying I want Jalen Brunson. I'm trying to give you all the real about what the Knicks are probably going to do. Okay, some of y'all acted like raw Hebrew said, oh, I want you. No, I don't want Jalen Brunson. And no, I don't want to trade Mitchell Robinson or Deuce McBride or anybody for him. I don't. But I'm trying to tell you what the Knicks are doing. Okay, what Tom Thibodeau is going to do. Whether we like it or not, it's irrelevant. <laughs> they don't take a poll of the fans before they get ready to make a decision, y'all. See, I'm just what I'm trying to tell you. But if we got Jalen Brunson, 
let's say we got him in free agency. That's the best way to get him, right? In free agency. Let's say we got Jalen Brunson in the summer in free agency. No, he's not, you know, he's not an all-star. But we're not trying to, we, I keep trying to tell you, this is year two of a rebuild. Y'all can't forget that. <laughs> okay. There's no player we're going to get that's going to bring us a championship this year. Not going to happen. Okay. If we could get top six in the East, and I still think we can, to me, that's a triumph. That's year two of the rebuild. Okay. While you still, and you know, the thing that killed me about Tom Thibodeau's pressure Presser at the end of the game yesterday is the last part. Dag, I, can I play that last part? Because that was the funniest thing. Let me see. He can get in a pool. He can do all that stuff. He Wait. can work on his flexibility. So, he can listen lift. to this. He can watch film. He's talking about he D-Rose right now. He can encourage his teammates. After this. There's, there's so many things that he can do to help us. So, if you're not playing, do all you can to help the team. And just having him back on the bench, being a leader that he is, what does that kind Listen of to this. You know, I think it's critical. I think, particularly in our case, where we have so many young guys, and we have young guys that are playing. <laughs> you got to look at his face when he say that. We got so many young guys, and we got young guys that are playing. Like, it was a shock to him. <laughs> That he's got, he's got to play young player, you know, because he don't like to do that. Okay. <laughs> That's just how he is. All right. I just told y'all about Larry Bird, right? Larry Bird's rookie year, his rookie year, 79, 80, he was 23 years old. 23. Deuce McBride is 21. Emmanuel Quickly is 22. They're in their second year. I mean, well, he didn't say, Deuce McBride's a rookie, right? R.J. Barrett just turned 21 in his fourth season. You know what I'm saying? In his third season. I'm sorry, he's in his third season. But y'all getting the point. Today, the guy, the cats that are coming in as rookies are much younger than they used to be. When Jimmy Butler came into the NBA under Tom Thibodeau, he was 22 years old. Okay? What, we, what today is considered old, you know, for a rookie. But he don't like playing these young kids, man. He just doesn't like to do it. Okay? He just doesn't. But he understands that his roster is made up of young kids. So he said, we, can, we, we actually have young kids that are playing. So, look, I have ways that I'd like to see the Knicks handle things. I'd like to see Tibbs handle things. You have ways. We got to deal with what we have. Right? This is him. That's who he is. Right? So, now, we get Jalen Brunson. No, we're not going to win a championship, but I think what will happen is we'll have a more cohesive offensive unit with a real point guard that knows how to find bigs like Mitchell Robinson that you can actually start the offense through. Okay. That's good enough to get his own shot at the same time, good enough to know he has to get everybody involved. That's what you're getting with a Jalen Brunson. Like I said, I'd rather see Deuce McBride getting all those minutes right now from his rookie year. So that next year, you know, he'll be that much better, but not going to happen. Okay. Cause I know who we have as a coach, not going to happen. So with regard to what happened yesterday, just low energy. Um, again, you know, Alec Burks did not have his best game. One of four from three, one of four, which were all three pointers. He had four rebounds. He played 26 minutes. He was minus 17, had six points. It wasn't the best game for him. Evan Fournier. 25 minutes, two of nine, two of five, six points wasn't the best game for him. And of course, defensively, he was getting cooked. It was one of those games, man. It was one of those games. And I felt like the Knicks were really, they shot 34 threes yesterday. Um, Charlotte shot 39, but I just felt like they started the game off taking too many threes. And I know what Tom says when he says, if the shot is there, you got to take it. So that's what they're doing. They're basically following his directions. Okay. But I think Charlotte was letting them shoot the three, you know, and, and it got us out of the ball movement. And I think that's what hurt Evan Fournier yesterday. And, you know, is what it is. RJ, if you look at his stats, seven of 18, okay, two of six from three, that's, that's 40%, two of four from the line, 12 boards, five assists, two steals. But he was really late getting out to that three point line a lot yesterday. I mean, he was late a lot. Okay. And it's interesting. You know, one of the guys that really you could tell by his face, by his emotions, aside from his words, what he's really thinking is, is Mitch Rob. 
So they asked Mitch Rob. In fact, Rebecca Harlow asked him, you guys had trouble getting out to three point line today. What happened? And he's, and he just bit his lip because he didn't want to say RJ and Evan didn't do their job. <laughs> he didn't want to say that. He just said, I'm going to just leave that, you know, I'll let you can ask Tibbs that because <laughs> he knew that's what was going on. Okay. He knew that was going on. It was obvious. See, so they, and it was because they were a step slow yesterday. They were just starting off slow. And by the time they got going, Charlotte was already going and, and they're going, uh, Miles Bridges was killing. You know, it was just like that. And then Terry, scary Terry, you know, he's not a superstar, but he's a, he's really a star. I mean, to me, he's so, he's gotten so much better since when he came in as a rookie with the Celtics. His confidence is always on. He always believes he can make the shot. He's a big time shot maker, defender, you know, really good. The, the Knicks were going to get him, but they didn't, you know, is what it is, but. Anyway, it was just a loss, y'all. I told y'all it was a big game. We needed this game to get seven spots. Charlotte was also up for it. We just wasn't. Tonight, I'm feeling confident about tonight because of that. The only thing that would make me less confident would bother me yesterday. But Tibbs talked about Kemba. And he said, Kemba will let us know when he's ready to play. And when he's ready, he'll go. I'm concerned about that. Like, if Kemba was to start tonight, I'd be concerned because the ball movement would not be there. And he has to get reacclimated again. I don't know what's going to happen, y'all, but I'm feeling like if we, if we start the same starting five tonight that we started yesterday, they're going to play better today. Uh, tonight, they're going to play better. I, I'm, and Minnesota is going to come to play. Um, make no mistake about that. Just like Charlotte came to play yesterday, Anthony Edwards and them are coming to play. Okay, Cat is coming to show out in Madison Square Garden. So the Knicks got to be ready. I feel like they will be ready. Um, I feel like they're going to, they, you know, every pro, every NBA team, every NBA player is competitive. They're all competitive. That's what, one of the things that makes them NBA player. But they really have pride. All NBA players have some pride about them. And the Knicks are no different. So I'm expecting them to come out today sharper from, from the opening tip. And not start out slow. We haven't seen that slow start like that in a couple of weeks. We were seeing it a lot, as you know, in the beginning of the season. But last couple of weeks, they've been clicking, you know. And the offense was going through RJ again yesterday, which is why he had, he ended up being, you know, him and Julius with the highest score, 18 points. Um, and RJ had 12 boards, five assists, two steals. He also had six turnovers yesterday. So it wasn't RJ's greatest game yesterday by no means. But of course, like I said, I'm not worried about RJ. I'm not going to say, oh, he stinks now, like some of y'all are going to do. Oh, I told you all, like some of y'all are going to do. RJ's going to be an all-star. I'm telling you. I was right about Miles Bridges, and I'm going to be right about RJ Barrett. He's going to be good. Okay? I'm not worried about him. So I'm expecting them to come back strong uh, today. And RJ did play with good energy from the beginning. He just, like I said, he his lack of energy showed in getting out to the three-point line. He was just step slow, half a step slow getting out there. And in the NBA, you can't do that. They will kill you, as they did. OK, so tonight I'm expecting more. OB came back nicely yesterday. Nice effort. Nice um, um, energy. Five of eight from the three from the field. One of three from three. Six boards. Um, one turnover. Uh, actually quick. Twenty nine minutes. Five of eleven from the field. Twelve points plus five. OB was plus twelve. Led the team. Um, you know, wasn't bad at all. Grimes. You know, again, good energy. He got timid when, when Tiz was talking after the game about taking open shots and not giving up shots. He was talking directly to Quentin Grimes because Quentin Grimes did that a couple of times yesterday. He missed badly on, I think, his first shot. And then he was kind of timid, uh, for the rest of the game and shooting that shot. And he even moved from the three point line and he hit a mid ranger, but he should have took in the three. He just got a little timid and Tiz was really talking to him. You can see he, this is how he does it. He'll be talking about one player when he says, we got to take the three when it's open. He's, talk he's not talking about everybody. He's talking about Quentin Grimes. When he says, we got to make the right pass, he's talking about Julius Randle, <laughs> okay, and R.J. Barrett. That's who he's talking about. See, so he won't call out players, but the players know who he's talking about. And, of course, he'll get in them behind the scenes, as a good coach should. So, uh, Quentin Grimes played. He had five points yesterday, plus six. Defense is always on tilt for that kid. Um Quickly played a, a decent game yesterday. Good game. Taj Gibson, hmm, plus eight, hustling. But, he, you know, he, he again, he's older. 
See, he played 19 minutes, which is about what you want him to play. Okay, that's what you want. You want, and then Obi played 17 minutes, and he showed out very well yesterday. Um, and I, I look again. I still feel the same way. He'll be even better when D Rose comes back. When he gets a real point guard, that's going to look for him. And actually, quickly was making a more concerted effort to look for him yesterday than he had been because he'd been gunning too much recently. But he did make a more concerted effort to look for other players yesterday. He ended up with seven assists because of that. But it's not consistent. That's the problem. He's not consistently looking for his teammates. You know why? Because he's not natural to him. He's a natural scorer. He's a natural two guard. You know, that's, that's why. But when you get D Rose back, I think you're going to see OB play better. Now about the trade. Um, I just mentioned the possibility of trading. Some of y'all ready to jump off the bridge. I'm just telling you the Knicks want Jalen Brunson. They want him badly. Um, but the Don is, stu- is not stupid. He's not going to give away anything that he don't have to. It'll probably be a sign and trade after the season. I don't understand why Dallas would trade him now. And like I said, if they were going to trade, listen carefully, if they were going to trade Jalen Brunson this trade season, they would want a rotational piece in place because they're Dallas is fifth in the in the West right now. So they're not going to give up Jalen Brunson for a scrub or somebody they're going to waive. They want somebody that could be right now in their rotation. If they if the Knicks don't do it though, they don't pull the trigger. They could wait until the season is over. They're still going to have to give up somebody now. They're going to have to give something up. You know, I don't know what it's going to be, but they're going to have to. It's going to be a sign and trade, which means they're trading something. Something's going to happen. Um, I hope they don't overpay for him, though. Uh, I think the four years, 55 is really his right price. If they start, I don't want to go over. I would say I wouldn't want to really pay more than 64 million for him. And that's too much. I would say four years, 64 in the fourth year team option. I would do it that way. I wouldn't I don't want to overpay for Jalen Brunson. Like I said, I really don't want him, but I'm trying to tell you what the real is. Raw tells you what it is. And I'm saying to you, the Knicks want the guy. So he probably end up with a Nick uniform on. Okay, in the summer. Anyway, is what it is. Please enjoy your Tuesday and the rest of your week. We'll talk about the Minnesota game. Hopefully a Minnesota win by the Knicks tonight at MSG. Go Knicks. Shalom.